All right, there we go. Welcome, everybody. My name is John Buck. I'm part of the Beverly Study Community. We're here to discuss Jordan, Jordan Peterson's uh, 27, uh, 2007 paper, The Meaning of Meaning, um, and sort of just give a rundown for everybody in the audience so that they can get a better understanding of maybe Peterson's major sort of thesis. Uh, and then later on, we'll probably do a little bit more open discussion and try to sort of figure out what are the distinctions between Peterson and other people's works, especially Verbeke, because they're both operating in very similar fields. And I think there is quite a bit of overlap between Verbeke's work and Peterson's, but it'll at least just be sort of interesting to uh, kind of go in, into their differences. So we're joined today with Brett, who's regular to the channel, as well as Nick. Uh, but we're, we've got two new faces of Bradley, who has a video uh, or a YouTube uh, channel pretty much devoted to Jordan Peterson's work. Uh, you've got other stuff as well as long, along with theology and philosophy. Uh, and then also Trigva, who is a musician that's also been a big fan of Jordan Peterson for a while. And, and I, he's actually been on the channel before. We had like a long discussion from uh, Twitter interactions. That, we had uh, a couple. With, yeah, that, that was really good. Uh, but yeah, so... Today, we're going to go through The Meaning of Meaning by Jordan Peterson, 2007. Uh, well, I wasn't prepared to give a, a precise summary, but I mean, in essence... If you want, you can read the abstract. That might be easy for a lot of people. Sure. Well, I guess the most you know, uh, significant portion is the very first couple sentences where he says that the world is too complex to manage without radical functional simplification. Meaning, and this is the closest that it gets to defining meaning in this paper, even though he never actually like explicitly does. Meaning appears to exist as the basis for such simplification. So meaning is an abstract impetus to action. It's something where he said elsewhere, actually interesting in his converse, in a dialogue with Verveke at U of T. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so meaning serves to simplify the world because the world in itself is uh, it's permeated with an overabundance of information that's far too much for our finite, our very finite, you know, um, cognitive framework to, 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 to fully like digest, to fully right. comprehend. So, so you have to function, you have to simplify it in some way. Um, and you have to simplify it in a functional way and in a pragmatic way, because the limitations of being at least in its human form, as well as other forms that we know, um, requires, certain things in order to survive. And so things are fundamentally geared toward that survival. And that has to do with his Darwinian, uh, in part, it has to do with his Darwinian um, uh, framework with which he's working. Right. So would you say that his, he's sort of working off of that sort of maxim, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And that's kind of like how he's kind of approaching this where every, like, no matter, like the world's too complex, you can't actually contain it within your own head you have to make some sort of model and it's going to be wrong in certain ways but it can still be effective pragmatically towards certain goals yeah 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 exactly everything is still i can't remember the word off the top of my head but everything is provisional right, right. exactly some are better than others of course mm -hmm. um but nothing is final right right yeah um all right so he lays out in, in the paper sort of this three world model that it's pretty interesting. And, and you, you especially need to understand what, what he means by that in order to really understand the full paper. Um, Brett, do, do you want to sort of go through uh, the, those <laughs> three worlds? Uh, just sort of in, uh, in basic. I, 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 I just read it today. So I'm not sure if, uh, <laughs> if I'm the best to, to do it, to, to, <laughs> to summarize it. it this, yeah. It's, Trigba, it, would you like to? Well, First of all, I would say that I don't think it's really three three worlds so much as it, as it's uh, two scopes of the world. With mm. the the as you see on this on the screen here, yeah, you got uh, you got the first world. If you can see my mouse, it's the point A to unattainable, uh, or rather point A to point B. Except point B point B is in unattainable in this model. So so the world expands. You see the world around it, and that's uh, chaos, which is really around all around the the small world that he says world one you could think world one here world two here and then then you shape a new world three which is the same as world one except it works out of, well, out of the chaos 
the the way that I, I was sort of getting at in the paper he lays out so there's the determinant world which is where you have some sort of motivational structure and some sort of goal and then when your actions are working in alignment toward uh toward with your environment you provide that that goal is realized and therefore there that that's sort of the way things work that's order uh, and then yeah. you have chaos, which is the indeterminate world, which is where there are there are anomalies to um, our expectations. So you might have some sort of goal directed orientation, and then you hit up against some sort of barrier that, it, because it's not bringing you closer towards that goal, it it has a certain salience of be, of negative, um, and, and that's what is considered an anomaly. It's something that is. Yeah doesn't get us towards that, 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 um, what we're uh, expecting. And so yeah. that would be an example of the second class world. So of indeterminate or wait, uh, of, eh, in it's probably, probably best to understand yeah. not as worlds, but as uh, scopes of understanding the world. So right. let's say, yeah, that's good. You have the determined world the world you think you understand the known, mm -hmm. known territory as it right. discusses say, the maps of meaning. Then you have the world you don't understand, which you, you might call indeterminate if you want, but that's everything everything outside of it and everything inside of it when the anomaly strikes, mm -hmm. depending on the scope of the anomaly, of course. And right, it's almost like the fact that there are anomalies is an indication that there is this world outside of our understanding. Because if yeah. there weren't any anomalies, then it would just be that one world where everything happens in perfect alignment with our expectations. Yeah. All right. And, and then, then there's the third world, right? Or the right. third, yeah, essentially. The third, the third kind world. of meaning is probably more accurate to the paper meaning, because yeah. it's three right. kinds of meaning. Yeah, that's right. In fact, in the paper, he uh, explains them as three classes of meanings, mm -hmm. yeah. which, yeah, so it's it's interesting. So that that is actually very helpful because like we tend to think of meaning as being sort of um, singular like it's only referring to one sort of thing but he's actually pointing out no there's three different ways in which we can use meaning one within the determinant world the indeterminate world and uh uh the class three uh of meaning the conjunction between the determinate and indeterminate worlds uh, or let's which, say instead of what if it's instead of ways we can use meaning let's say di three different kinds of meaning we can process mm, right yeah, th that's true, especially tying into what we said earlier about how um, meaning is what is simplified for our ability to to use and utilize. Um, so the, uh, okay. Um, well, let me just add yeah, that ahead, he, he does provide something of a definition, I think, of meaning uh, where he says, this all means that meaning is the significance of our determinate worlds, the implication of the events that occur during the, enact, the inaction of those worlds, and the sequence and hierarchical structures that we use to organize motivation and emotional, psychologically, and socially. Um, hmm. so, so, good yeah, on. I wonder if we can like put break that in, down into an example as like what would be um, something that would work there. Uh, well, what you were you going to say? Something in the book. Yeah. Or in the book, as in the paper, he mm -hmm. he used example of writing a sentence in a in an academic paper. Right. Yeah, so he, he actually takes like a meta example of what he's actually doing and actually bringing it forth in here. So, so yeah, the um, he uses um, the write a sentence as sort of a small term goal that is nested within his larger term goal of write manuscript. And so when he completes the small short term goal, goal of write sentence that can move him to a next place of, OK, uh, finish paragraph. And then once that's finished, that can be, OK, finished page. And then once that's finished, then you can do, oh, all right, uh, edit pages. And, and then from there, turn in manuscript. And, th and that's sort of like the, um, I don't know, the, the fulfillment of a broader goal via fulfilling all the constituent elements of that that broader goal and, and that's yeah. a i think strong point of um position in peterson's work uh, and especially brought up in this paper is how our larger term goals if they do not have some sort of smaller term constituents that allow us to enact they are sort of just not just irrelevant but rather um, vacuous, I guess, in a sort of way, or ideal in, in the sort of sense yeah. that you can't even 
they're not even applicable to you anymore. Yeah. And you need a manageable number as well, because uh, he makes up the point that it's not a random number at all when he talks about the uh, about uh, less, preferably less than seven uh, sub mm. subcomponents to each goal, and the reason being that our operating memory can only hold up to seven items at a time in general. Mm. There are obviously exceptions to that, but that's the rule. So preferably less. Mm. Okay, so that's interesting then, especially tying into the symbolic sort of aspects of the number seven. Yeah, <laughs> especially when you consider that uh, in his broader theory, he has mm. seven archetypes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Exactly seven. Now, as for uh, it, I, probably the most interesting aspect of this is his uh, third class of meaning in, in regards to the conjunction between the determinate and the indeterminate world and how um, how we're to act in relation to the indeterminate world. Um, yeah. Especially since he ties it to rituals and then the representations of our rituals. Yeah. And, and part of that sort of reminded me of um, some, some of uh, your, your uh, topics that you've brought up before, Nick, on the, um, the aspect, well, like the, the cultish aspect to communities such that they can sort of like provide these frameworks for people in order to, for one, resolve their uh, existential crises or their, um, um, I don't know, psychological um, problems that they're going through, uh, but also provide for them a, a sense of community that and sort of shared goals. And, and that's the thing, because we exist within an environment that is not in perfect alignment with our goals, we have to have some sort of system in which we can either update our environment or update our goals. Um, and so that's where the third class of meaning is really uh, important. And I think I think at least that, that's especially where shamanism, uh, as Peterson brings up in his book, The Maps of Meaning, and also Verbeke brings up in one of his yeah. earlier lectures, um, that they, they play that 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 key figure in the the third class of meaning, sort of that the the figure that spans the boundaries between order and chaos. Yeah, the character that dissolves and then uh, and then re recreates itself or re reforms. Hmm. In the in alchemical symbolism mm. and shamanism, yeah, he even had a, a line in there about the person that uh, creates culture. And there was another point. Um, oh, his acknowledgement that fact uh, is something that only occurs between other people. Hmm. So it is hmm. a social. That, that is fact is intersubjective. Yeah. That is that is really interesting, especially that brings up sort of the um, a couple of the the points in our in our interview with John Verveke, um regarding the propositional aspect in regards to community, that the fact that people have shared propositions or shared facts that provides them the system in which they can cooperate with each other. In fact, um, Peterson brings up the, the point that like when people are working in alignment with each other. Um, then they exist within the first class of, or in the first world where things are going according yeah. to expectations. Like the fact that I can interact with you it is due to these certain societal expectations I have that you're not just going to start yelling and run around and, and like leave the call all of a sudden for, for no reason. Yeah. So that means to stay inside this one, except it looks more like this one. Right. Yes. yes. That, but yeah, that, that's his add... one world. It's actually not fully within the known world, and that might be pulling in some of uh, Verbeke's Dialogos project, which is mm -hmm. to say there's a superset or a kind of meta rule set that everyone, so it is functioning within expectations. However, mm -hmm. those expectations afford you novelty, afford yeah. you adventure or uh, exploration, we should say, yeah. uh, in a setting where you can make sense of it without it harshly disrupting your world making or worldview uh, apparatus, your meaning making yeah. apparatus. Right, that, uh, that, that's actually good because the, the, the question that you'd raised to, to Verveke had to do with the sort of, um, uh, what is it, open quest or, or permanent quest where Perpetual. there is, yeah, perpetual quest. There you go. That doesn't have some sort of like set goal in state. 
but rather is always questing forward without actually having some sort of home to rest within. Like there's no satisfaction of some sort of goal. And then um, that provides for you, like the point that you brought out very well, I think, is that affords the individual or the community of individuals a new avenue in which to explore new environments because they have some sort of like yes. home base of, and it doesn't even have to be like physical, but even like a conceptual home base. So yes. in uh, Descartes' meditations, he sort of like put on his back, like in order to go through his meditations of radical doubt, he had, okay, I'm going to retain my um, religiosity that I was born into. He, he was born Jesuit. And this is sort of what I'm going to rely upon if this type of radical skepticism turns out to not afford me anything new at all. So I'm going to, it's almost like a, a, something that you can have on the back burner, that, which I, I find quite, quite fascinating. And I think a lot well, of people rely upon like their religious structures, like the Bible as something foundational sure. to them yes. like that. For sure. And I would say that specifically the type of exploration that is afforded when you have some structure of home is specifically transcendence you cannot have transcendence in a perpetual quest because there's nothing to transcend hmm. you're just shifting modally between worldviews right you need uh that that almost kind of a dogmatic set in order to have an experience like transcendence where you recognize that the context in which that set was operating Mm -hmm. is not actually the context in which it's operating, right? It doesn't blow it apart. It doesn't break your worldview, but it recontextualizes it such that the symbols are now referencing something different, right? And you mm -hmm. can view that almost in the postmodern sense where I think specifically what's thrown out in a postmodern worldview is transcendence, right? All you get, we start confusing transcendence with deconstruction. Right. The mm. only way we learn how to get out of our frame is to destroy it. Right. Whereas in some more basic sense, right, I can use the example perhaps to bring it down to earth. There's <clears throat> right. The classification of your identity as right. We are all male. Now, within a postmodern context, the only way to break out of the, to transgress against the category of male is to break down what it's referencing at a, at a kind of basic level, leaving you in this yeah. groundless place. Whereas a transcendent way of approaching that would actually be to recognize perhaps, right? who knows, I'm coming up with a description on the fly here, but to realize that the category of male is not actually touching the um, most important and perhaps sacred aspects of your identity. And yeah. so there's no reason to actually destroy it because it's not commenting on the thing that you legitimately find important. Yeah, male is a static identity, but the but the important identity is uh, is much more flexible. Yes. Hmm. But now, do you think Sorry, this paper though tangent. though supports? No, no, that was, good. The, no, that was uh, awesome. But yeah, do, but do you think th this paper seems to support? Uh, I think the dynamic quest, because what he presents is a situation where. The environment, like you can never find, if home means stability, like permanent stability, you can never find that because the environment's always going to come in and and ruin it and right. force you to either either succumb or voluntarily pick up your axe and you know your. I think and, he's saying you know, don't have forward. a naive sense of home, which mm -hmm. is to say the home is found in the the third type of meaning, not in the mm -hmm. first two. Right. If you yeah. set it, if you set down your route in one of the first two, you're going to perpetually create a problem of your home always disappearing. Right. Whereas exactly. when it's within the meta narrative, right, the thing that is affording meaning as the interaction, you can very much have a sense of home. It's just that we don't view it in this static, um, naive sense. Right. He yeah. actually sort of levels the same critique as Brett Weinstein does against the uh, religious rituals and, and traditions that um, tradition can never satisfy as they're the, I don't know if this is a direct quote, but they're the products of the, the past. When we were like, all models are false or, or all models are wrong, but some models are useful. In the past, there were useful models, but because they were 
simplifications to reality, they, they cannot withstand a extension in, into the present moment that we're at. But yeah, bringing up uh, sort of like, I guess, making the, the third class of meaning or, or the third world as sort of that uh, resting place does make a lot of sense. And, and yeah, he has the uh, definition just for our audience of meta narrative as the story of the process that transforms stories. So yeah. the story is sort of that, that class one where you have point A, point B, these are the actions in which to get from point A to point B. That's a story you have there. And then you have the, the transgressions to those stories where you have point A, point B, um, oh shoot, the necessary component to get you to point B um, is now lost. I don't know, like doesn't say, exist, never existed. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. So now point B cannot work as a story to work within. So that's when you're thrown into the pit of chaos, as Peterson would say. And, and that's when you require that third sort of system of updating your story so as to, to um, continue to exist. Otherwise, you're just stuck in that pit of despair. Yeah. Uh, so the story so has that's to why be you dynamic. Need, yeah, you need a story has, that transforms our dynamic. stories. Right. Yeah, but uh, there's something I'd like to note on, on this as well, because it's absolutely correct that the at the in in dialogue, for example, there's always this kind of smaller dissolution of the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. So you have you have the small smaller smaller goals that are that are shown to be unreachable, and then you have the bigger goals. For example, let's say have a hanging conversation you can learn something from, mm -hmm. and then you, and that's a, that's a dynamic goal, right? Because you don't know you don't know what you're going to learn first of all. So. This model fractionate, fractionates as you as you look closer. You can always this, you can always make, break it apart further. You, can, you see the same model on a smaller scale again and again and again and again. Inside every point A to point B, you see the same model, the same model of the of going from the world one, let's say, to mm -hmm. chaos to a new better world, which is better insofar as it accomplishes everything the previous one did and more, which is a definition of better he, he proposes in Maps of Meaning. So I guess that's where you can recognize patterns or archetypes in these different stories that are re consistent across time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. By the way, that things are that that models fractionate usually indicate they reflect something biological because the biological world. If you've seen the, hmm. if if you've seen the Fibonacci uh, Fibonacci sequence, mm -hmm. that one fractionates in the same way. It just goes on and goes on. You can see it on smaller, smaller scales. Okay. It's the same thing that maps do when you look closer at, closer at the components. If you look at the coastline, right. the further okay. you go, the, the bigger it becomes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that makes more sense in, in regards to coastlines. That like any map that we might have will have uh, such a level of detail that you can't actually map it correctly. Like even using pixels or anything like that. The more you zoom in, the more fractioned are fract yeah. like the, the boundaries of continents or islands are fractal to them. Yeah. Um, Bradley, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, there's one thing uh, when you're talking about meta narrative, there's mm -hmm. a there's an interesting um, back and forth that Peterson had during one of uh, the Harris dialogues. I think it was the first one, not you know not the podcast, um, right. but when they were in person when I think Peterson is talking about, and, and he talks about the same thing with respect to free speech. When he's talking about freedom of speech and when he's defending freedom of speech, he says it's the process by which we update our information. That's why it's paramount, right? So that's why he sets it so high up. And that's why he identifies it so closely to the logos because logos, word, speech, rationality, so on and so forth. Um, and he talks about that same thing um, in the context of the Peterson, I mean, uh, in the context of the, of the Harris dialogues because they're talking about religion. And Harris, insofar as I'm familiar with him, and insofar as he, has, he expresses ideas in those dialogues, he was talking about how he sees um, a lot of religious uh, systems, such as, for example, Christianity or Judaism or, or, or whatever it might be the case, um, whatever else, that he sees them as overly dogmatic, right? So they're too, too much order, too much stasis. They don't allow for update of information, right? Um, but Peterson is actually contradicting that and saying that, no, the logos is the paramount value in Christianity, according mm. to what Peterson is expressing, at least. Um, and that same logos is, uh, you know, truth, it's speech, and so on and so forth. And it allows the update of information. There's still there's still a paradigm, right? There's still dogma, right, in Christianity and in Judaism and so on and so forth. But uh, but you see the same thing, and it's not necessarily 
meta narrative, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's the solution um, when you're talking about where is home, right? Where is my identity? Where am I resting? It's not necessarily the meta narrative, but it's identifying as, uh, as that process. It's identifying with the process that transforms stories to counter the, uh, what's he, what he calls the meta problem of what is the um, perennial problem of emergent anomaly. Because anomaly yeah. is always there, right? There's a snake even in Eden, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, so the solution then is to identify with, to identify with that process of story transformation. So that's the meta identity in which your home should be according to Peterson. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to connect with that, but I can't remember off the top of my head. So I'll throw it off to you guys. Okay. Well, I, yes. Well, I was just going to mention how, how the, that process of updating your uh, identity reminds me very much of for Vicky's like uh, the agent identity relationship yes, where yes. you can update your agent so that even in the in the face of a constant uh, of a arena that's in constant flux you're able to update to that arena but yeah go ahead and Virginia. i w i was just going to bring up that in our conversation with verveki i brought up anatheism specifically mm -hmm. to create that reorientation um and then i argued that right the the specifically the Christian story is fundamentally anatheistic in its shape. Um, well, what is anatheism? <laughs> anatheism is, is basically the return to God after atheism. Okay. But the way I was playing with it, which is probably not uh, wholly consistent with the person that created the term, um, was to, in some sense, have faith in the story itself rather than the figures of the story so in in that case it was um, by switching the sense of faith away from the personas that it's instead shifting it towards the actual narrative structure which is to say i have faith that if i lose faith in the personas they will resurrect they'll come back i don't have to hold on to this um in a sense, in the dogmatic sense, right? And that actually affords this ability to integrate new information that conflicts with the um, idolic frame that the religion was taking before. If that makes any sense, I'm speaking strangely. Yeah, I don't know what idolic means. I, I think I made it up, but okay. idolic, <laughs> um, right? Yeah. Idol yeah, gotcha. focused as opposed to icon focused. Uh, mm. Okay, <laughs> something static uh, that we impose uh, on reality that is necessarily error bound. Okay, so it's so it's um, preserving the narrative structure even if the metaphysics is something that one re ultimately ends up rejecting. That wonders mm. well and it's not even rejecting it's it's in some sense allowing it to fluctuate as it does in ah, the process okay. of incorporating new information because you know that that next stage will necessarily um present itself again it mm. will resurrect right i don't have to um, falsely preserve an errant worldview gotcha yeah. And it's worth noting in that sense that identifying with the process means that you identify with what moves from this world when it dies to the next one. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. We, we got a question in the chat from Paul Willis. What is the relation between traditions and patterns? Well, <laughs> that's a question. Yeah, it seemed like in the paper, Peterson was using, there's the, the rituals, which are the uh, enactments of behaviors. Uh, and then there are the some uh, the representations of to sorry the representations that provides I guess sufficient motivation to enact those behaviors. So let me see. In, in uh, <laughs> I, I guess this ties into what what I commonly use as metaphorical truth, where if you have a certain belief that provides you the faculties to enact a certain behavior that is. Um, um, either provide you, yeah, let's just say provide you with whatever goals you have, then that belief has some, a pragmatic utility to it, even if there is no realist um, correspondence that that belief has to reality. It has some sort of correspondence with the enactment of these certain behaviors that provide you with some sort of end goal. And I, so if, yeah, so I would say that 
traditions are, I guess, maybe the collective aspect, the collective rituals, oh, uh, uh, along with the motivating beliefs, so as to provide uh, the enactment of those rituals or behaviors. Yeah, you might say it's it's everything people do for a reason they don't really understand. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah to make it more good. concise, for the, for reason they don't understand, uh, li- understand explicitly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's although Verbecki would say that we should be doing these rituals in ways we do understand. You know that 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 we should be deliberately enacting this. Uh, he calls it serious play. So enact yeah. enacting these patterns in play to help. Uh, I guess train the, the the neurons in our brain to then enact them out of play. Uh, so yeah. I think that's that, that's probably the link. I, I think getting at the the core point in this question, it seems like traditions would fall more within the world one aspect, whereas patterns is more within the world three aspect. Because even though the um, the particulars uh, within these stories or traditions are very different from one another. Like, so say within Christianity, we interact with other Christians and, and all other humans with the belief that they are children of God. Whereas within Buddhism, we interact with other people be, uh, with the understanding that there is what the, um, the, the, the Buddha within them or within Hinduism. Yeah. It's they the, can all become Buddha. Yeah, right, right, right. And, and so these are like completely contradictory traditions, but there is a shared pattern to them that could only really be recognized from somebody in that sort of like um, third world or, or I'm saying third world, but uh, outside perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Outside perspective. Yeah. Very good. And the whole point of tradition is to internalize a certain pattern to, yeah. ma- I guess, cultivate a certain pattern over and over and over again. Well, that depends on the frame, right? Because from inside the, inside the tradition, they would say otherwise. I mean, all example? traditions are rep- repetitive, right? That the the idea of something being a tradition is that we do it again and again and again. Right, right? but I think Trigva's point is that it's not to uh, within the tradition. It's not to share some sort of commonality to those outside the tradition. It's just to this is something within well, your tradition alone. Right, I'm saying to reinforce to the pattern in oneself. I sure. think is mm. the the goal of the and, and one's community. I guess. Yeah, that would be the outside perspective, but I agree. Yeah. Well, right, it gets rationalized or turned into fact on the internal of the uh, uh, culture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Inside right, the that bubble. gets back into the, yeah, the Peterson's thing. little line in, in this paper. Yeah. Uh, and, and about the patterns, I think I think to say I really like the point about uh, from the third world, going back to the model and just uh, re- accepting that we call it the third world, even though it's uh, even though it's not really the same world, just in a new way to understand it. Yeah, I think that's about right because uh, traditions are what uh, are what we base our our old world on, the, the, where we start out, the known territory as we start. But the patterns are what we use in chaos to build the new one. Yeah. So there's this. In, yeah. The, the the really interesting thing is how how do our first world mappings be updated? How is it that happens? Now, it seems like just to take sort of an example same, uh, similar to within the book, if Jordan Peterson's goal is to write the manuscript and then that hones down to, OK, write this specific sentence, but he's working at it and working at it. And so this is the, the smaller frame of goal set that he has finished this sentence, but the sentence he's not able to write correctly. So either he can continue to work on this sentence until it gets to the point that all of time ends, uh, or he can choose to reject this frame one goal or yeah, and throw out that sentence, right? And just continue writing uh, so as to, that's where you're you're not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, And it seems like the, the, the way in which we can reject our frame one goals is through um, reference back to our higher order um, larger goals. It it still seems like it's working upon some sort of frame one sort of sense of or world one uh, sort of sense. But it's just the fact that because our uh, constituent goals aren't being fulfilled, we have to 
take one step uh, outside of that to see, okay, what is the broader goal set? And then what can I do to meet that broader goal set? It's, yeah. it's sort of like this um, framing in or framing out, or uh, I forget how Verveke uses it in his lectures, but sort of going in between. Yeah. Reframing, reframing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in Peter's work, I would say that that's, uh, that would constitute a normal problem, a problem that you can, that you can uh, solve while staying within the own territory. Okay. Because you still know what you're going towards. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a revolutionary problem, and you have to go into the chaos on the, on the greatest scale you can imagine. Right. Okay. So yeah, that's a good point for like the body sattva. Um, he had this sort of framing of like what it meant to be, a, to live a good life. And then upon recognition of say death and suffering and things like that, this sort of threw him out of the frame to the point where he's in a pit of chaos until he can find out either like, like a new frame to, to enter into. Yeah. It, the, yeah. The story of Gautama Buddha is also very good one for, to illustrate this. Okay. Although, so here's one thought that kept arising as I was, as I was, well, listening and partially reading through this paper, which is that um, Peterson seems to have a heavy focus on bottom-up processes. Yes. And he did not nearly as clearly explicate how top-down processes might work. So I guess in this case, we could also, right, he frames everything as fundamentally originating from the recognition of an anomaly, right? What happens when you have spontaneous revelation that then allows you to recognize the anomaly that was invisible to you before, right? So mm. it seems like there's two, two directions to this process. And I was mostly only getting one from Peterson. And there's good reasons for that because it's in the one that he's speaking of that we can integrate things like personal will and um, personal action, responsibility, those types of focuses because they are building up from starting within your own kind of personal phenomenological frame. Uh, let me see if I understood it correctly here. So revelation from... Uh top down so let's say from the person inside the person do you decide to look at it in a different way or do you mean do you mean it's so different way let's say from an external source like like a god it could be god it could be the world it could be right even just um Some i don't sort know of like there's new, many ways that it can arise it's just frame. not within the self like we can't we can't claim responsibility for its arising to some in some sense it's just I've had experiences where I, it was not right. The problem I was in was not recognized until I had a comparison that seemed to spontaneously arise to recognize, oh, there was a problem there. Right. So it's, it's the other direction of Verveke's relevance realization. Right. It's not it's not stemming forth from my encountering of a right. problem necessarily. The problem is recognized in contrast to suddenly yeah. finding myself in a different world. Right. So, so in Verveke's work, he would like, I say that's the non-logical identity that you have between person A and person B. It's not the fact that person A had some sort of goals or sets of expectations and then something um, m messed up that, that sort of goal and set of expectations, yes. but rather there's something outside the whole goal set that person A had that actually sort of, puts them into a state of not being that same person A anymore. It actually puts yes. them into some sort of new set. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and I would say Peterson even hints at it. He just doesn't develop it in this paper in that uh, he has that, that area where he's talking about how right, reality fundamentally presents itself uh, as a paradox before right. we have relevant or irrelevant or right we, we start applying all these um sense making uh, tools on it uh, you know f fitting it into our world view um well, well this is where we might be able to, to link it to to verveki like like you were saying what happens when we we suddenly discover something was relevant that we didn't know before well we can get better at determining what's relevant by cultivating our relevance realization machinery by by you know, enacting the the psychotechnologies like meditation and so on, uh, you know, serious play to get better at determining these uh, 
determining what is relevant. And as Peterson says in this paper, if you can only t- take into account seven things at once, the better you get at doing this, the better those seven things are going to be. The, the more relevant those seven things are going to be as you go through life, because we have to, because we, we have to ignore the rest at any one point. So you have to guess, basically. When you don't know, you have to guess. Yeah. Yeah. So when you have to guess, how can you get better at it? Yeah. Right. How do you, yeah, how do you get, get and, and he or 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 better, he would say, how do you get better at insight? So the mm-hmm. better than guessing would be to have good insights. And how do you get better at having good insights? And Ravecki provides sort of ways to help cultivate your ability to have better insights. Through. Well, and another way of framing that perhaps is how do you get better at asking questions to begin with? Yeah. What are the right, right questions? What are the wrong questions? There's, there's the tool set for how to answer questions properly, right? That's how to, when the anomaly presents itself, right? There's an a priori question in the anomaly. Yeah. And then problem solving. Uh, it seems like, yeah, Peterson is going, well, look, there's this problem solving. It reshapes these things. But it, at some point, it's like, where does wisdom come in defined as how do I ask the correct question right. mm. um, in the presence or perhaps not even in the presence of what I determined to be an anomaly? Could that be tied to your, your point of like, when you have a sense of home that provides you with a sort of exploratory pattern that you're able to sort of ask these questions? That... I would say that's what I'm aiming for by making that distinction okay. is that it affords a higher degree of wisdom, we could say, mm-hmm. um, in informing our question. Right. Uh, so otherwise, for... we are stuck in a, in a, a pseudo panicked frame. Right. Whether so... we are experiencing it as panic or not. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah. So, so is it that for both Peterson and I guess Verveke, we can never reach point B? in that that little graph we're always moving towards it but we can't actually attain it yes and i even specifically wrote right within a pragmatist frame you can have a buddha but you can't have an enlightened buddha Hmm. you can have buddha the ascetic who's Mm -hmm. endlessly gnostically pursuing his freedom from the material world by endlessly projecting himself into himself into ever higher states of consciousness right? But you never get the enlightened Buddha. It doesn't exist in fact. There's no final one. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so rather than say we can't ever get to B, we may not be able to get to Z or Z for you Americans. The, yeah. that, because like, as, as Peterson says in the paper, you know, because we can only take into account whatever these seven things in choosing our goals, we have to be smart at what goals we choose. We have to choose goals that, that are, we're capable of of accomplishing so so we can he, he wants us to get better at choosing what b is so make b realistic make b fit within your capability yeah uh, realistic and actionable yeah now nick though like it, it almost seems like this could still be a critic uh, critique that could also be leveled to your um suggestion that we adopt an open-ended telos because it seems like if a telos is like uh fulfillment of uh, actions in order to attain point B, an open-ended telos would still have that same sort of problem where you're, there is no point B that you can actually attain. To some degree, again, it depends on how you would define enlightenment as a final perfect state or as a dynamic, um, well, mm. I'll use the word again anyways, perfect state, right? But again, it, it this does sounds to me like permanent quest. It, it sounds like you're talking about permanent quest yeah. there, Nick. All right, so is it that it's instead of meta home is what it yeah, is. is it instead of framing these things as a, I guess the, the popular Vervakian term, a, a forum of things, or no, sorry, a, a world of things, you're framing it as a forum for action. So there's the way of being that is point A, and then there's the way of being that is point B. Yes, yes, and right. And I you think can it actually makes more sense to B. frame it in sense of optimal dynamic state. That's the word I was looking for. Hmm. Um, right? There is some point of completion. There legitimately is. If you're taking a meta view, there is literally, you can't get any more optimal. There's nowhere left to go in optimalness. 
But that doesn't mean that the rest of the play stops. It doesn't mean that there isn't still a dynamic interchange between agent and arena. It just means that there's no more potential to cash out on how effectively the um, agent can translate and interact with the arena. So let's apply this to the hero's journey, okay? So in the hero's journey, we have uh, we have the hero who completes the cycle mm -hmm. and then returns home. Mm -hmm. But when he gets home, he has to he has to work with the people who are there. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and I think also right. It's no accident that the fourth quarter of the stories are almost always missing in our myths and narratives, mm -hmm. right? We we only get to the 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 third the end mm -hmm. of the third arc which is the hero returns home and there's the celebration, but we don't actually, it's rare that we have a myth where we see the transformation itself, right? Yeah. Whatever your, I, your story is. Yeah. And you might think that's because we really, we can't really talk about it because we don't know exactly what it is. Yes. Well, yes. it's interesting. I don't know if you've read the game of Thrones books, but that was actually one aspect I got a little, uh, a little bored with by the time I got to the fourth book that, there didn't seem to be an end that that the journey just kept on going. It was just like we were watching their lives. Uh, I, I don't, this, the, in the movie, the, you know, in, in the TV show, they just brought it to an end. But but in, in the books, it, you know, you know, so many of the characters die and then you have new characters and and there was no satisfactory, you know, moment of of realization there. So the, the you just, appreciate you know, a teleological uh, take on story. Life. Yeah, I, I definitely <laughs> appreciate a, a teleological story. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, you know, and, and the hero's journey. Like you want that. You want the payoff, right? You want the payoff of the hero yeah. you, uh, of the journey. And when you don't get it, you're like, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable here. There's something. Yeah. There's something missing. And about but, that idea about having an open-ended telos, I I don't think that's necessary at all. If you think about the the whole process thing, you might think that you always have something you want, right? You always have something you want, and on the way there, you're going to experience these kinds of transformations. So you don't need to worry about that at all. It just happens unless you get too locked up in the one goal to even look at anything else. I think that's the key part is the open-ended telos is intended to keep us from sliding into a dogmatic teleology, but also trying to rein us in from just a, a kind of arbitrariness to life. So it's like, how do you preserve goal orientation without turning it into a blinding um, hmm. I, I wonder if this is like this is this, sorry. This conversation is just like this. May be a downside of the hero's journey that they they train us to want that payoff, but life doesn't always work that way. You know where you where you have that payoff, and like the soldier goes off to war and he's a war hero, but then he comes home and there's no jobs for him and he has PTSD. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, depressed you know, and alcoholic, and yeah, yeah. The hero's journey <laughs> doesn't necessarily train yeah. us. The hero's journey doesn't necessarily train us for that. The, the life goes on after the journey's over. But religious stories usually do a decent job. For example, uh, the story of Noah is one that immediately yeah. came to mind of, you know, the great hero. And then, like, you keep watching he's it. Naked and, and he's naked and drunk. Like, and... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So the I Old Testament, I think, does does more of a job of that than the, than the New Testament, maybe. For sure. Uh, the, for sure. Just... The Old Testament is almost like the J.R. the the George R. R. Martin, where you're just you're you're watching through their lives, and it's like they're not always heroes, and you know, yeah. the, you know, the heroes do some pretty iffy things too. It's uh, oh, which it's is why I like a, a full uh, like for example, Peterson's psychological, tales. like their psychological tales make sense to me. Sorry, what was that? Nick? Oh, I was just agreeing with you that they're almost just like the whole of the Old Testament is just an account of the failure of being a hero. Yeah. Well, like you can all see the that different ways to fail it. Yeah. You can see that too within like Greek mythologies as well. You'll have the, the hero Theseus that goes uh, and slays with the, the Minotaur. And then after that, he's like conquered the city or something like that. And then he has kids. And then his kid uh, ends up um, being deceived somehow and ends up dying and to the point of, that I think Theseus, like, it, it's because of Theseus's blindness that his son has died and so that like puts him into despair that he's no longer the hero and i think it, <laughs> it, it it's yeah, yeah per per perennially apt to re yeah. recognize how you're not always the hero to the story 
Yeah. You, hey, especially or, or even sometimes you fail. Yeah, and, and and the heroes like I I train myself on. Well, fantasy. sometimes you have to fail in order well, for this there to be a hero yeah. to the story. No, but sometimes you're not like you're the hero who just fails, and and you don't and you don't. And you it's don't because of that overcome. that the story can be a happy ending. Actually, <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's a tragedy. Yeah, yeah, but I well, think, it's a like, tragedy like, for guess, you, but a comedy for everybody else. But but the well, hero really trains it. everybody to want to be the hero. And and that's when we fail, uh, and we don't overcome. It hits particularly hard. It can lead to anxiety, depression, and and so on, because you see yourself as the hero, and then wait a minute, I'm not the hero, and yep. and I you know I wasn't the hero I thought I was, and so what do I do now? And it, it, it'd be nice that we could all have the gumption to just be the hero all the time, but I'm not sure that's psychologically realistic either. Well, so, actually, that depends on how we, on how you understand being the hero. Because uh, I, I would say that the maps of meaning model of, that we've just looked at earlier, which is in effect all of Peterson's models, that model is essentially the same as the hero's journey, except it's way more abstracted, and uh, it is it is in fact so abstract that it applies to every single action you undertake in your life. So, insofar as you're the main character in that story, you are the hero of that story, and you and you do heroic actions all the time, except when you fail. And you fail all the time as well because you're not perfect. So you, it happens all the time on a small scale. People yeah. just uh, forget the small scale and look only at the big ones. Yeah, the hero I guess that comes into the where... chaos of a dirty sink of dishes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. just like coming to where more like uh, what myth are you embodying or what archetype are you are you playing? Trigva. You can you repeat that question? Rephrase it maybe. I forgot what you said, so I forgot why I said that. But what what um I was saying is like, forget it, go on. Yeah, th well, there's many different types of heroes, and so like, are you the tragic hero? Are you the comedic? Yeah, hero? yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But that's a big scale again. I'm talking small scale too. On the small scale, we do the we undertake the heroic uh, action of dealing with the chaos all the time, or at least all right. the time when we don't feel ashamed of what we've done. Mm. Yeah, no, I understand that you're always the yeah. And in that sense, you succeed, and things become better afterwards. And the smaller the scale, the more true it becomes, I think you can say. But the bigger the scale, the more often it will be wrong, and it's going to crush right. you because you expect the wrong things. And because your scale is so big, and, and you picked a B that maybe wasn't as realistic as you thought, and you don't mm. get there, uh, it, it can hit yeah, it can mm. hit hard. So That's so when, you, so, that's so, when that's it can put you into a pit of despair, because like... Yeah. It, and have an entirely negative salient reality that you exist within. Yeah. Because sure. everything's you an obstacle. The wrong, huh. You picked the wrong B. And, yeah. and again, he says in, in this paper, I don't know if I can find the, the again, I, I think I talked about it where he's talking about the seven th things that your goals, it's just very important how you pick your goals. And yeah. Well, that's interesting because like uh, Peterson's crit criticism of Nietzsche is that you can't pick your own goals. There's yeah. an aspect to us. Uh, our, there's an aspect to us where our goals are ingrained within us. Well, not so our we goals, but our values. Them. What we what we try to aim for, you might say. Our our personalities are within yeah. us. Like you can't oh, yeah. you can't just diminish a certain aspect of all of your personalities and then hope to work out in the world because otherwise they're going to come out through um, what is it projections? Yes, yeah, where you you see the um, uh, the the persona of the other person, or, or I forget. There's like a a positive. So you have the shadow negative. and the persona, right? The yeah. shadow of the persona. The persona is how you present yourself or how you understand yourself. The shadow is what doesn't fit in that model. Right, and so yeah, you'll project, I guess, your own shadows onto the world around you. Yeah. Or, so or it's, quote, it I, seems I, like in in some sense the hero is always the tragic hero, right? Depending because scale, even the yeah. comedic he hero, it, it, in some sense, we're, we're only <laughs> able to see it as comedic because we're cutting out part of the story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah as long as you <laughs> end it with, and they lived happily ever after, you don't actually get to see the part where Theseus ends up like having his family relationships be destroyed. Yeah. Or you might think that the stories end where they do because at that point, the perfect state is attained. And then it's just a matter of, do they maintain it? And the fairy tales say yes. Real life, right? Rarely <laughs> says yes because Not, people aren't perfect. Yeah. So I should say, yeah, the non-naive um, uh, hero's journey 
in some sense ultimately ends in failure. Uh, right. Even even right, and that's again like why are why is the Bible such a bizarre story? Well, because the point of failure is simultaneously the point. It's revealing the fundamental underlying paradox, and then giving us an avenue to experience the paradox directly instead of trying to err towards the comedic hero or the tragic hero. So this is kind of interesting about the the Christian story for Christ, where he has that. Uh, I don't remember the Greek, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where he's hit some sort of obstacle point where this is a failure on his, like he's failing in his story that he was expecting to live out somehow. And then despite that, there is this sort of like uh, rejuvenation or resurrection uh, for, for that story to be able to continue. And so maybe that's sort of your anatheism that you were sort of going into it a little bit earlier. We're having faith exactly. despite failure. Yes. yes. Well, but it's interesting. Christ is the hero who is perfect. And, and you're supposed to, you know, tr- try to be Christ-like. But that means trying to be perfect when we're incapable, incapable of being perfect. So you're, you're bound to perfection. fail. Aspiring. Uh, yeah, aspiring, aspiring perfection. Mm-hmm. But you're bound to fail. So on the one hand, you don't want to pick goals that are unrealistic on the other hand you yes. don't want to just pick goals that are too safe right yeah. because then you're never going to push yourself like you're 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 you're, you're never going to excel if if you say well i don't want to pick a goal that i'm likely to fail at so i'm going to pick a goal i'm guaranteed to succeed at but that mm-hmm. which i probably leads to unsatisfactory mediocrity i guess right yeah, you which could be say. which could be better than 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 complete failure for some people. <laughs> but, yeah, so that uh, that really is the the standing on the border between order of chaos, where you know you're going to fail, but you also know you have the ability to succeed, which is sort of like standing in flow state. Whereas if you're exactly just playing like the that. easiest game, yeah, if you're you're setting a goal where you're only going to be able to succeed, like I'm going to play Duck Duck Goose or something like that with four year olds. I'm always going to win no matter what. So it's like the easiest game that you could play, but it's not challenging. It's not fun. It's, it becomes tedious to, to exist within. So, so, so here I I found the quote about the goal. So he said, human beings appear to be low capacity processors, so to speak, with an apprehension capacity of less than seven objects. A good goal requires consideration of no more things than we can track. So that's a little bit different than like, here's the thing. The goal should be difficult and you shouldn't choose a goal that is an impossible for you to to reach but so if if your goal requires you to keep 15 things in 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 mind at the same time you're just not going to be able to do it you are bound to fail Uh, so so you want a challenging goal but but one that is still within the realm of your capacity pushing yourself to to complete i would think yeah so maybe one way of framing that um, would be, right, the cultivation of wisdom is in some sense affording us that optimal goal setting. But right, again, there's the other aspect, like a- attaining wisdom is fundamentally impossible, or as Verveke brought up in our chat with him, attaining honesty is impossible because it's not that type of goal. So there's something about that. Yeah, uh, it's something that has to be performed over extended periods of time, and you only attain them as long as you perform them. Yeah, yeah. that's a virtue. That's what makes a virtue, mm. you might say. Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's very good. That's interesting comparing then virtue as opposed to moral, where moral has much more of that closed teleological sense to it mm-hmm. whereas virtue has much more of that dynamic teleological mm. sense to it yep yeah that's yeah. very that it's very interesting how all, a lot of these sort of modern problems can be, sort of be pointed to and that's a lot like what verveki is trying to do is to go back look backwards to, to sort of the ancient greeks and what were their sort of responses to these things and like what can we actually learn from them and actually using the, their same sort of models to for for ourselves yeah, and he's not the only one. Basically, everybody does that these days who are concerned at all about the state of state of things. Mm-hmm. They just uh, focus on different ones, and I think you see a lot of commonalities in what they what they conclude. 
if you if you're looking for patterns and want to try to build a new world, you might say. Hmm, right. So there's this. It, 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 oh, yeah. Go ahead, Nick. I was just going to point out how bizarre it is that of all the historical figures, uh, Verbeke seems most drawn to Socrates, mm -hmm. who in many ways uh, resembles the Christ story many more than many people mm -hmm. he could have chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? yeah. Murdered by well, his friends. Well, there are a lot of, the yeah, the, the, <laughs> I guess the, one of those themes is choosing to do what's right rather than what's just going to cause you to be accepted and, and survive mm -hmm. but which is interesting when we talk think about you know the darwinistic approach which which, <laughs> which might not uh which might be more get along what is it get, go along to get along yeah or, yeah exactly yeah. well that actually depend, depends on the scope of it right because uh, if you look at peter's models he his argument is that uh, in order to preserve a state over, over an extended periods of time it needs to be updated which is again the problem with tradition it has to be updated from time to time yeah. and in order to update it you need to be revolutionary in some sense and when yeah. you are revolutionary you get cast out but if, if nobody's revolutionary the society dies yeah and that's like exactly why he brings in the the nazis and no ordinary men and uh, the nuremberg trials where if yeah. everyone is just going along to get along and there are no revolutionaries that are willing to die for what they believe to be true in um what is it uh, the the russian author um, in, in the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the, then you, the, the society demolishes. And so there has to be some sort of love for something other than oneself that you are willing to die for in order to um, hopefully provide the, the, um, the way in which that society can, or, or that thing that you, you love can be existent in some sort of sense. Yeah. And I would say that the point the point here is to note that in a Darwinian scope, you have to include this as well, because otherwise everything around you, the society that you depend on as a human being and various other species as well, disappears. And you don't right. you're yeah. function without it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there has to be space for that. Although in the although frame. I would say that I mean, as a from a Darwinist perspective, I mean Darwinism functions on groups, but it but it but it's by way of individuals. So so it's you know, mm -hmm. so it's yeah, it's interesting, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, but I agree in, in in a sense that you know we all lose if we don't if we're on a self destructive path, you know we're all gonna lose, and if so, if someone has a sacrifice, well, they were gonna be lost anyway, but at least it gives they can have the significance and they can feel good about having helped uh, yeah. change things for the better. But it, it's, also, it's an interesting. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And also on that note, you could you you could absolutely explain this kind of thing with the genetic variants. Mm. Mm. That people that some people are more conformist and other people are less conformist. I think you even see that in the ocean model for personality. You know, the big five, mm. agreeableness. People who are less agreeable are more likely to be evolutionary. I think that's a fair way to think about it. Right. Mm. So he has a, an interesting quote where he says where he's talking about uh, figure five. Maybe if you want to point out pull, pull up figure five. Figure five portrays the process of voluntary determinate world eradication and exploration predicated reconstruction. This transformational process is both perilous and enriching. It is perilous because descent into the motivational and emotional chaos extent between determinate worlds is stressful in the truest sense of the world. It is enriching because the unexplored anomaly contains information whose incorporation may increase the functional utility or the very nature of one or more determinate worlds. Uh, this makes involvement in the process of transformation a meta solution. Uh, you know, I find that interesting. Now he he brings it into right into religion, but to me that sounds like active open mindedness uh, that that Verbeke talks about, and that or or skepticism uh, of where you you should in principle be always willing to test your ideas to to make sure that they're mm -hmm. they're capable of you know of being attacked and seeing if they survive. So, yeah. you know, your, your determinate world eradication is putting your, you know, being prepared to let your ability, your current views fall and, yeah. and, and exploring those views and new views. Uh, mm -hmm. That seems know, like yeah. faith, really, that you're willing to put them through the process that they might die. It is a kind of faith. And a and faith that the important thing <laughs> maintains, or that the, the important thing remains, even if you break, break everything else. If, yeah, like I think I'm that not you sure can't break the most important thing. Yeah, 
Like I was going to say, yeah, because what survives, because the process is designed, if you do it right, the process is designed to leave you with at least, you're either with your, your original ideas, which have now survived and are therefore stronger, or you're with new ideas, which are stronger. So it, 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 it's more the pro, a reliable process that's designed to give you the best results. I'm not sure if it's... I'm... Well, but you need faith in that that process will give you a better result. Yeah. Take, uh, sure. take the cut again. If you look at his, uh, his radical doubt, right? He started mm -hmm. by, by trying to find something certain. So he started at point A, mm -hmm. and then he tried to reach point B, which was certainty. On the mm -hmm. way, the only thing that remained was himself. He existed, therefore he, he mm -hmm. thought, or he could think, therefore he had to exist. So he was what remained through the process. And he mm -hmm. started that process because of faith that he would find something. And that's that ties into that sense, right? Meta home affords us the, mm. the willingness to go through that process. Yeah. In the same way that not having your home in that kind of meta world actually removes the ability of that process. Yeah, so that's sort of raises the question, can you go about existence with an open hand to everything that you believe? everything not at the not same everything. time <laughs> yeah 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 that's a good point not at the same time um, well and right the way i was describing it specifically in relation to christianity is that the faith that it will resurrect never leaves that's where the home becomes and because the home is located there it affords the ability to die and rebirth yeah but that goes the challenge right because there's a lot of christians who only think it has resurrected not it will yeah, I should yeah. say also the faith here, if you're going to call it that by trust, the, the faith trust applies to the process rather than the result. Of, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the interesting thing is like, even though there might like in, in point A, there's this thing that we uh, or that we're working towards. And then as we go through that process, we find out, oh, the thing I was working towards wasn't actually what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. But yet I was still working but, towards yeah. it. And so again, there's some sort of continuity. The eternal quest. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the eternal quest that it's not the destination, it's the journey that gives us our meaning. Yeah, like, like no, so it's not that you win, that's how you play the game. It's the same idea. But again, you have to be careful with how you're characterizing the eternal quest. Meaning you that can't... you're never satisfied when you get to the and that okay that's it like when you were talking about the goal should be to be don't optimal. set your home in the having mode yeah set your home in the but being that doesn't mode. mean so, you don't have a home yeah, yeah so so yeah so i guess i guess there, there's two ways of saying like you were talking about the optimal like your optimal way of processing like saying being a wise person so that's that's i guess an optimal being mode where it's not about the propositional home it's about the procedural and perspectival home yes. i guess and yeah. and even there i think we should always be like trying to hone our methods right so so you know i like our optimal mode is always optimal for what we can figure out now we should always be prepared that we never know if we actually reach the pinnacle of optimal uh of an optimal no. mode how sure. did, how would it even come to try to know that it's uh, it's outside of our scope of knowledge right all we can do and is hope. So, so we could say, hey, this mode is working for us now until the next anomaly comes and just destroys it all. And maybe we have to then say, okay, well, now I've got to shift it a bit. It's not working anymore. And, yeah. and I think oh, the and home I think... is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, pass up, just is to, if you expect the, the anomalies to come, you're probably better prepared than somebody who's saying, well, I'm home now and there's no, and everything's going to be good. Yeah, that's yes. a problem. Well, if you write it into the story, right? If it's part of your meta narrative, that mm -hmm. meta narrative is going to, you know, afford you more freedom for dealing with problems than if it's not. If you have a naive meta narrative informing your, your story. right, so that makes the distinction between an ideologues uh, narrative and a go. religious narrative. Because within the religious narrative, it's actually built as a paradox. Like there, Abraham is both the the the, the father of uh, Israel. And he's also the guy that lied to the, the Egyptian pharaoh and made all these mistakes and 
uh, all, all these aspects to him that isn't like a perfect hero. Um, and, and yeah. You can stop sharing, by the way. It takes away our picture when, when, when we share. I'm just realizing. Fair enough. <laughs> I was having some did internet we, issues. Did we lose Bradley? It looks like it. Yeah. Both muted the no picture. Bad sign. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, there's this a aspect while reading his paper that stood out to me as being anti-Darwinian uh, okay. in a sort of sense. <laughs> uh so let me see if i it's at the beginning i'll actually share it um on, on the paper that i have let me see here we go all right so this is uh at the motivation as the first order solution to the problems of self-maintenance self-propagation and complexity we must survive and propagate in a world whose complexity exceeds our representational and functional capacity so Reading this as sort of a materialistic Darwinian, this seems ultimately backwards. It should read, in a world whose complexity exceeds our representational and functional capacity, we do, uh, no, it's because of interacting in a world whose complexity exceeds our representational and functional capacity, do we survive and propagate? It's, it, it, he's placing the motivational structure first and then the reasoning behind it second whereas within the sort of um uh darwinian frame of the the fact that we have motivational structures in the first place is because they were um um uh, evolutionarily fit to and, and that's what causes us to have yeah. these sorts that's of next, uh, next sentence that's the next test sentence yeah okay so motivation serves to initially address these problems a given determinate world is engendered as a consequence of emergent insufficiency along a basic motivational dimension. That's the thing with this paper is it's like full, full of these, uh, much, like it, it takes a lot of focus in order to sort of understand because he's packing a whole ton of information into. Uh, yeah, like maps and meaning. That's yeah, why yeah, that book yeah. is heavy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so, but I, I realized this as going, while going through the paper, let me uh, stop sharing screen. Uh, because he actually um, raises sort of an objection against this sort of behaviorist approach where with the behaviorist approach where um, you have an or animal that has certain uh, natural inclinations or desires or motivations and then um, you do something that um, provide uh, that uh, gives them a consumatory reward then that is what reinforces a certain behavior to the point that they're able to now do that behavior sort of automatically without having to think about it or even have the reward anymore because it's just so ingrained within them now. He's sort of objecting to that because for human beings, we act off of a motivational structure of goals rather than of drives. And so this is going to be tough to unpack, but it, it the it's not quite as straightforward as a desire satisfaction of the desire, desire satisfaction of the desire, desire satisfaction, because we don't know what things will satisfy our desires. They're in this sort of anomalous, uh, no, sorry. They're in this sort of potential paradoxical state where they could either be um, satisfying or unsatisfying, depending upon what goals we have that's going to affect what salience we have towards these objects. So in, in the example he gives in the paper, you have to uh, arrive, actually not in, in the paper, this might've been a different paper. Uh, you have to go to uh, this interview of, for a job somewhere. And so you're running late. You have to run and go do that really quickly, but um, something happens uh, or there's um, some sort of like line or barrier, like a road's blocked off. And suddenly this has a negative salience to you because of the natural goals that you might have. But if you were to look at your clock and realize, oh shoot, I forgot today's daylight savings time. I, I don't have to rush. This, this, the, the, the fact that the, the, the road is closed doesn't even matter anymore. It, it, it's, it, so it loses that negative salience all of a sudden. Whereas from the behaviorist approach, this would be much more static, I, I, I guess, they, they, that we have sort of natural inclinations uh, for what's going to be positive or negative towards us. And then 
things that are in line with those will affect us. And then from there, you can sort of build up. But I, I think that that I was didn't get around to it quite properly. But that was at least sort of my trying to understand why he puts motivations first, because they're due to goals rather than from drives. So in a sense, they're sort of not top down, but it's rather aspirational towards point B rather than some sort of like backloading behind point A that's pushing you towards it. So there's two bits there. Uh, one is that we might consider that flip, the, the same flip that occurs from the modern frame that gave birth to Darwinism and the pragmatist frame that follows Darwinism. Um, mm-hmm. And the other is that there's a distinct, the thing that's probably more on point here is that there's a distinct, <clears throat> his third uh, world of meaning or however we were phrasing it, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's seemingly the point where self-consciousness comes in, right? Meta-consciousness. Mm-hmm. So we are aware that we are aware, whereas all of the other motivational structures and world building even that he's talking about can happen in totally um, non-conscious, non-self-conscious right. creatures. That's in fact why Descartes thought that animals were non-conscious because they followed this sort of like set of behaviors and potters, like he was a sort of like a behaviorist in a sense that like all of this can be done if the animal is just an automaton, it doesn't require any sort of like internal structure to animals, but we ourselves, we recognize through introspection that we do have something else that then gives us justification for having the dualistic Cartesian model, I guess. Yes. So in some sense, the first two worlds are functioning on a staircase that goes up or down, whereas that third is something in like Escher's staircase, (laughs) right? Yeah. Perhaps a stressed analogy, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think uh, I, I, I was trying to pull uh, 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 Hofstrader in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, another bit I was wondering about in relation to how he set it up in this um, paper is the meaning that comes not from seeking out of lack, but rather the meaning that comes from expelling an excess. So, right, I I would almost pose this as a fourth world of meaning. Um, So would this be sort of like, almost like Cartesian radical doubt, where I'm going to doubt everything, even to the point of doubting my own existence, or uh, I'm not sure... You probably, I mean, that certainly could be considered an excess and it was not one I considered from that angle because now you're kind of like sure, yeah, uh, it, it can be flip-flopping some... okay. uh, lack and excess in, in, a, okay. in, right, in excess of lack oh, and okay. express the lack, <laughs> right? right? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the, so is this like isolationism? Oh, you both said something at once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, sure. All right, so... Isn't that uh, flip-flopping of lack and excess something that can happen with, uh, you can do with any kind of need? I think you need to make a case for why, for why there would be a difference. Why there would be a difference. Okay, well, the example that I was thinking of is that, uh, right, a classic human, uh, we could say third meaning motivation, love, mm-hmm. right? We seek love. And this comes from perhaps some innate sense of lacking it. And Mm -hmm. so we, we fish around the world, right? We confuse it for all these things. We think it's attention, right? That's motivating most behavior on, on social media sites, things like that's coming from this place of thirst. How can I Mm -hmm. gather more of this? Um, And then there's this other expression of it, which is when you're so overly filled with the sense of love that you cannot help, but let it spill out, right? You're no longer Mm -hmm. seeking it but there's still this deep sense of meaning in the expression of it, not in the sense of trying to recuperate the love, get a return on your investment, but just because the the cup is full, it necessarily starts falling out. Right. So it's not coming to try and repress it and like hold it, compress and like stuff. But 
I don't know, there's another, there's something else happening there. There's a different process that I did not see explicated in this paper. Right. So instead of like having a, some sort of aspect of deprivation, like I need this thing and I'm going to act so as to attain it. I have this thing already, but I've got more than enough to give to other people. I can be like, <laughs> I've got to do something. And, and, and so it doesn't I'm, present itself as a problem necessarily. Right. Mm, that's a good point. Right. Like, it, so it just kind of freely falls, right? This is almost like, how do you tie in Taoism to our very strongly Western theology uh, hmm. basis that Peterson is functioning on? That's interesting. So like, would his model only work in a system where there are perennial problems? There's always going to be problems. And that's what allows you to sort of like continue to exist. But what if yes. you get to a point where there are no problems anymore? There's no snakes yeah. In Ireland. Yeah. And it's do? not it's not a naive point, too, because it is legitimate that from inside of that problem solving framework, when we find ourselves in a position where there aren't problems, the sense of meaninglessness is real because it's in some sense, we it's it's the admittance mm -hmm. that we formulated the question wrong to begin with. So yeah, we solved the problem, except now. the problem wasn't wasn't the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the problem can we actually the reach problem. an Eden? Unless it's the solving of the problem that we want rather than the solution. Or alternatively, perhaps you could think of it like this, that uh, this state is never going to come about because there's always going, to, always going to be new people with new problems, that the problems don't go away permanently. So there's always something to do. Yes. Well, there, well I, I, the point that Nick was making is that there could be things to do even when there aren't problems. Like you have a surplus of something and you yeah. can do something so as to like share this surplus with others, like yeah. what Bill Gates does. Like, it's not like he's lacking anything, but he's able yeah. to provide for, for other people. And yeah. it's not, and it's not a, a perfect example because associated. Yeah. it's not a perfect because there are problems and that's what he's trying to resolve. But yes. Yeah. But as I understood it, you were talking on, on a grand scale, but you hypothetically could have have this happen everywhere all at once. So, so all problems will be solved instantly, let's say. Um, so well, okay, so from the Petersonian frame, a problem is an anomaly to our expectations. And so there's possibly a world in which there are no anomalies, uh, but- well, No, 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 a problem is, some, is when you don't have something you want. <sighs> when, when, you have, when, you, when you have a point B that you want to reach okay and you have another problem when you can't reach that when you can't, when you can't reach that point so, so i think the, in, yeah go ahead nick i was just going to say in the case of an excess of love it does not present itself as a problem defined in that way right it's not that you're sharing it because you're trying to get to some goal necessarily again it's just a natural hmm. outpouring of something that you know you're already full there's no more Right. Uh, so let's say you tricky. want to make lives better for other people, something like that. You want to make everybody's lives better. That's something I, like that I would say you then. could apply that, but I would say phenomenologically, that's not present. Hmm. Because? Because it's, again, it's, it's before, it's happening before the rationalization. It's happening before the problem formulation. Right. In the same way, like water falls down a hill when it's raining. Right. It's not solving a problem. It's just falling down the hill. Yes. Yeah, so you could think of this like uh, you get you get so used to, to to operating in a certain mode that you don't need to think about it anymore. You automate it. No, I think he's saying that like you're satisfied. Like so. When, let's say I, I'm in the desert, I, I, I'm thirsty, and so I'm desiring water. I find an oasis, and I drink to my heart's content, and now I have an, an oasis here. Now, I could, like, try to adopt the model of, like, um, oh, there's other people in this desert. I should take what I have in this oasis and help other people. But that doesn't have much the same motivating factor as when I had this innate sense of desire or, or thirst in order to reach water. It's not quite perfect because uh, 
I, yeah, it's I, not yeah. automatic enough in this case. It's right. not I, coming from the a priori. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's the, hard the for underline. I think it's hard for us, Nick, to understand like how if you're in that state of perfect satisfaction, you could be motivated to do anything at all. Yeah. Well, and that's that's what I'm saying. I would say it's it's like legitimately another category of meaning mm. in that it presents us like I don't have good language for it. I, all I know is that this is a phenomenologically possible experience. Mm. And so it needs to be fit <laughs> if we're going to create yeah. explanations around meaning. Yeah, um, I think I understand what you're saying. And I, I'm trying to get to that point, get to that point as well, because uh, what what so to try to reformulate it here so you're saying that just po- that is possible to get into a state state where you where you don't even want to do things you just do them because they feel they just come so naturally to you yes and that and that's and that's a state that you you using love as an example so yes you you share love because it feels so natural that you don't even need to think about why you do it you just do it yes exactly <laughs> Yeah, and you think and there's a through the natural outflowing of it, through the sense of it being satisfied, it does create meaning. Um, but it's yeah. not the same meaning that we experience in the pursuit of love. Yeah. Let's say positive meaning in the sense of uh, satisfaction, happiness, contentness, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Keeping in that negative meaning is also something that exists, but might not be very yes. prevalent in in this state. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I think that's a state that you can reach hypothetically within the within this kind of model, but I don't think it's a new world because uh, because you might think that as, as you approach this state, your goals are going to change, and at some point you don't need to think about them anymore. You might say that you approach what uh, what religious religious would be called uh, being at one with God or be or walking with God. Yeah. yeah, walking with God or walking behind God, all those kinds of things. Being in the perfect state, you might say. Right. And you could think that that's something you approach and you hypothetically could reach. And if you do reach it, then uh, it doesn't matter anymore. So it's fine. You don't need a new spot in the model for it. You just need to be aware it could happen. Right. So yes. Peterson's well, it, model is sort of like within the fallen state of humanity where yeah. point A is always going to be the unbearable present. And then we're aspiring towards point B. But it seems like Nick is sort of pointing out that there are occasions where we're actually in point B and we still have some sort of, um, I don't know, desire, we're, we're still able to do things. A deep like, sense of meaning, I would say as mm-hmm. well, in right, this paper's the meaning of meaning. Mm-hmm. So if we're I mean, talking we ask... about meaning, it seems like there needs to be some account of whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, how, to, how to shape it and all that kind of stuff is, I, I guess I'm worried that by ignoring it, we are in sense encoding the problem too deeply right. in the sense that we're creating a sense of meaning that necessarily needs problems. Yep. And oh, if yeah, we don't but, have a but, counterbalance to that, then we end up taking um, uh, an error as a metaphysical reality. It, it, Except that, when you don't, it, it, when you don't have about, problems, you don't have problems. No. So it's fine. Yep. Yeah, but, but it's not just per- because he's not just talking just about but the you have meaning, hero's journey yeah. like, like we talk about the hero's journey being for the little things you do too you're always going to get hungry again like you're 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 always going to need sleep you're always going to have to pr- provide for your family or or someone falls and skins a knee so so we we tend to think in terms of just the big the big ticket items but 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 there's always going to be that day to day yes no matter what that's good yeah and i'm not by any means saying we should discard that like that's definitely not what i'm arguing this is all really important stuff i'm just saying there's also other this other thing that Mm -hmm. in your perfect state you do those things still but you don't feel like you need to then just do them yeah yeah Hmm. yeah Yeah, it's it's switching from a moral imperative to a type of perfect amorality Mm. Right. And I've used that to describe uh, Christ before. Right. It's he's not an example of perfect morality. He's the example of perfect amorality. He's not playing the game anymore. Right. But he well, can't. he's not stepping outside of perfection. It's perfectly within. It, it is in some sense defining moral through the action itself in the yeah, sense except- that Peterson talks about. Here. Yeah, except I would say that uh, there are some examples in the story of Christ that uh, 
that suggests that he's absolutely playing a game. Yeah, certainly. Many. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. And he's doing that very consciously, very intentionally. For example, when he decides not to go help his uh, dying friend before or after he has died. Lazarus, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Eating grain on a, on a, on a, or picking up grain on a uh, Sunday or Saturday. On a yeah, Sabbath. And so on. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. So there's a very clear idea there that he, he knows what he's doing. He's doing it deliberately. And uh, in that sense, it's not, the, it's not the same kind of affection. And that's, that's in Christ. But see, I guess that's where I'm getting at with he's not playing the morality game in, yeah. the, in the sense that, say, the, the, the um, oh my gosh, Pharisees were playing, right? He explicitly yeah, sure. criticizes them on following the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Yes. And that, so, like, what's the spirit, and do we still call acting in the spirit of the law morality or is morality is written into the idea of morality the problem that we cannot achieve it right and so we create moral and immoral out of the impossibility of actually being moral right hmm. as re restraining factors guiding factors to push us against our natural motion our natural action towards something yeah. that is fundamentally yeah. unachievable you make me think of Nietzsche and his uh, his celebration on uh, the origins of morality in Beyond Good and Evil, where you mm. have the we have the good people who just do what they do, and you have the the lower people who look at that and uh, ascribe morality to it. Yes, yes, yeah, mm. yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I was just kind of thinking, like I was seeing a similarity between your criticism, uh, Nick, and, and Nietzsche's that like Nietzsche has this quote of like. The Christian uh, desire to see the world as horrible, brutish, or no, the, the Christian desire to see the world as dark uh, and horrible to live within has made it dark and horrible to live within. That, like, if yeah. if we're if we're only looking at things, if we're centering our philosophy upon there being problems to reality, then we're always going to be faced with there being problems to 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 reality. We'll create right? the problem. If only to to continue to exist, yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I that's think the even, a, that's even that a critique is, uh, Peterson makes. Yeah. yeah, and here I would say I think the perfect example of this is uh, Søren Kierkegaard, the famous uh, existentialist philosopher, yep. who explicitly said that his his purpose here was to give people problems. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, that was Kierkegaard. Yeah, that was. Yeah, in uh, Danish, <laughs> problem, it's probably more like what I, what I pronounced. It's how you would say it in Norwegian, Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Were there uh, any other points that we wanted to bring up? Uh, I know we're already at like an hour and a half. And I know there's quite a few notes and, and like points that we all sort of wanted to get at in the uh, Discord group. I'm posting one in chat right now that was asked of me. Bradley? Oh. <laughs> we lost okay. him again. Oh, no. Uh, all right. Yeah. At least he's got I, camera I saw him now. Brooding there for, <laughs> I saw him brooding there for a second. I was wondering if, like, we put him into an existential crisis. He had head and Oof. hands. It looked pretty, pretty rough. But <laughs> no, this is an empty chair. This was anomaly. asked of you? Yeah, in, or... the, in the meeting chat. Okay. On, the, on Discord. There he is. Uh, yeah, I was just, good. I was reading something. I wasn't having a crisis. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> what a relief. Unless reading something is itself a crisis. You know, it usually is. Oh. <laughs> on what you're reading. So, let's see, who was the last question? It was, uh, it was Cobra. I, I'm guessing that's uh, CM Bradley. Yeah. So you 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 asked if if perhaps I could help uh, help you deeper understand why the meta solution of identifying with the process of story transformation is first embedded and transmitted in narrative and drama uh, long before explicit articulated proposition and knowledge. That's a mouthful, first of all. But it's not it's not really that complicated. So 
<clears throat> let's uh, let's break it up a little bit. So we have the meth solution. We've already discussed this a bunch, right? It's the whole it's the whole st revolutionary story of making a new making a new better understanding of the world when the when the old one fails. <clears throat> which changes the story. So then we have the sto story transformation. So why would it be embedded and transmitted the narrative and drama before explicit articulated proposition and knowledge? <laughs> well, this has to do with the whole bottom up thing. So Peterson is a very, very evolutionary thinker. He, he, starts, from, he starts from the basics of, uh, of what you need to do to survive and so on, and then, uh, then expands on those. So in this case, you need updates to the story on uh, various levels, including rituals, in order for in order for society to sustain itself. And you need this before you need before you need any kind of complex language. So it has to be older than language. So how would it be transmitted? Well, imitation is one form. And uh, then you see what what works, and you accumulate those over extended periods of time, and you try to figure out why why it works. So you use pattern recognition and uh, and combine it with uh, what you use to fill in the patterns where they've got holes, which would be usually fantasy, imagination. How could this possibly work? Why could this possibly work? And you create a story. And then you have the story transformation in narrative. So you start by just uh, having your orienting complex, the systems in the brain that drive it, that, that lead your attention in different directions. You might also associate with uh, Mercury in uh, Greek mythology and alchemy. Which is then directed in the directions as things surprise you, and uh, when things surprise you, your body can't afford to stop completely. It need it just needs data. So in order to gather that data, you stop until you think until you are confident that it's safe to move. And then what you do when you start moving? Small things first. You might think of this as play, but it's also you could also think of it as careful experimentation to see what can I get away with, kind of like. Uh, Kind of like if you look at uh, the story of uh, Cain and Abel, Cain trying to get away with as little as possible, as some breeding suggest. So what can you get away with doing next next to this surprise? And uh, as you experiment, you get a more, more and more stable understanding of it. And at some point, you have something that, that lets you accomplish what you wanted to do initially, or maybe some new understanding in it entirely, where can, perhaps this is a new way to get food, something you can manipulate. And at that point, you have a story. And you get lots of these stories over time. Everybody has them in their own lives. Say, a baby's first experience with food, which would usually involve the mother's breast. How can I manipulate this to get something I want? And over time, you get lots, as I said. And they go together, and you associate what what is what did they have in common? And then you use fantasy to elaborate on that to tell to tell the story. And before you can tell the story, before you have the language to tell the story, you, you do it by imitation, which is drama. You enact the story, embody it. Over time, you also develop a form of some form of language, or at least we do, as, as individual humans in our lives. And, uh, and as we do this, we can look at it from the outside without having to do it, and we can discover new, new components and uh, abstract it. And it does that way we can propose it in other, in other forms than just telling the story. Is that a satisfying answer? Yeah, that was really good. Thank you. Yeah. So it's the long it's it a might... long process in every, that every person undergoes in their own life that also speeches undergo in the long term. We might also say that the synthesis occurs um, <clears throat> right when when Verveke's four types of knowing are all functioning together. And our closest way to encode that is by relaying the events and the actions, right? When yeah. it was embodied. So we recount it yeah. necessarily in the narrative form. Once we yeah. have the narrative form, we can pull ourselves away from it and abstract the pattern yeah. that's kind of hidden in, in it. Um, yeah, as uh, as Peterson put, puts it in his uh, or doesn't, and this is not a quote or anything, but it's based on a model he used in Maps of Meaning. He he talks about three different kinds of memory. We have the procedural must memory. We understand how to do something, and then we can do it, and we remember it as an episode. A time, one time we did something, or one time someone else did something, and all episodes are stories. 
And at that point, we already have narrative and we can remember it as such. And then we have linguistic knowledge or semantic explicit meaning propositions. That's a third kind, which is developed by looking at stories. And uh, that's it. Hmm. All right. <laughs> I, I think that might be a good place to stop because we're at an hour and 40 minutes. So I want to try to keep these short so that they're uh, available for people to sort of um, work their ways into without having to have a whole lot, a lot of time investment to go through. So if, if there's any other points that we want to touch on last couple of minutes, we can. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, end the call. <laughs> so, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I have links to everyone down below. Uh, and yeah, we, we should be doing more things sort of like this uh, in, in the future. Uh, maybe we'll look at more papers from people. We, we might be uh, looking into like different debates or lectures that are uh, around on the internet. Uh, if you want to uh, make suggestions, you can do so in the comments to the video or join us on our Discord to uh, make suggestions there. And then, and even if you want to take part in any of these types of conversations, you're more than welcome to. So thank you everyone for watching and thank you everyone in the call for also uh, participating. God yeah. bless. Oh, by the way, one thing, one oh, yeah. thing I'd like, to, just uh, just a compliment I'd like to have on air. I really mm -hmm. like the interview with uh, John Maveki. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're really happy with it. Th thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, it'll be really interesting to go through uh, and better understand each of his, like, that's the thing, when you're in the process, it's hard to fully grasp uh, his responses to you. So it, it, I'm very happy that we were able to record it and be able to go through it again. But yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us and have a good day. Thanks everyone.